Good afternoon. I know that uh, we, our very interesting conversation has to be worthy because uh, we are just before the party. So we have uh, to start the party here in this panel, I think. And I, I would like to start the party with uh, some two quick remarks, taking advantage that I'm holding the microphone. Uh, first, uh, to tell you, all of you, to please keep tweeting and keep uh, contacting your high highly connected networks about our friend Basel Kartavil, who is missing in the prison in, in Syria. We do not know where he is, and any effort, if, if the message uh, gets into the right uh, uh, person, maybe we can save a life, and, and that uh, is a valuable member of our community, and we, sh we should be tired, uh, we, we shouldn't be uh, sparing a second on, on trying to save him. And the second thing that I want to uh, highlight is uh, both in the leadership of Korea team and in the leadership of uh, Creative Commons team, how valuable women are. I mean, we are one of the most remarkably uh, women-led uh, uh, organizations, and I think that uh, uh, that's a highlight uh, and a value at the core of Creative, Com uh, Creative Commons community. <laughs> and so, moving, <laughs> moving to the open internet, I, uh, I wanted to ask uh, one of the two questions. Uh, I picked two questions from the questions submitted on the online platform. And are the two of uh, the questions are good starters for the conversation. Uh, the first question is for Professor John, John Chong. Yep. Um, and it is about, uh, you have said, it is coming from uh, South Africa, the question. And uh, someone in South Africa likes to know that uh, as a person following your scholarship, that you have uh, said uh, in many statements that the internet has brought good things and bad things for society in general. So this person wants to know, know whether your position or your opinion has changed and how it is, uh, how is the reality, if you could share how you see the things here in Korea, how it has improved and how it uh, has gone like a, uh, bad in society. Mm. Hold on, yeah. next question. And the second question is like, okay, you wrote your famous book, The Wealth of Networks, 10 years ago. Uh, if you were about to write that book today, uh, what will be the same title? And, what, uh, and from 10 years to now, what has changed? And what, what would you uh, frame differently? Just not on that one. <laughs> no, no, no. In the meantime, I'll think about what to answer. <laughs> um, so it's great to be here um, in, in, with Creative Commons in Seoul. Um, what's different? Um, I think some of the things that were perhaps more speculative in terms of the uh, stability and significance of the commons and commons-based production are really hard to question anymore. Um, core utilities continue over a decade and a half or two now to really be produced by free software. Wikipedia really is the central model. We're seeing the model develop across efforts at governments to become more responsive to citizens. We're seeing companies trying to build things that are more engaging uh, with users. Uh, we've seen people use the net for social mobilization to move the politics um, only recently in the US we had what would have been con inconceivable with the victory on net neutrality, would have been inconceivable eight months earlier. And so in this regard, the book uh, is, remains strongly anchored in the realities of life. At the same time, a central, um, a central assumption that, uh, well not assumption, a certain observation that was true at the time and that, I may, and that I claimed was very central to the development of commons-based production, generally peer production in particular, was the fact that for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, we had seen the core pieces of capital widely distributed in the population. Computation, communications, storage, sensing were widely distributed in the population, at least in the population of the wealthier countries and allowed people to do the things that always came naturally and socially to make things that were economically meaningful. People, could, people always sat around in a room and spoke to each other and talked about the news. 
But doing so online made it into a news service. People always helped each other with doing things together or tinkering together or fixing a car or doing whatever. Doing it online suddenly made it into a core infrastructure like a web server. What we've been seeing in the last seven to eight years is a reconcentration of the truly powerful infrastructure and a weakening or, or, or thinning of the, inf of the capital that's in the hand of people. So I'm talking about the move to the handheld, which brings us uh, infrastructure that is proprietary over the uh, cellular networks. Uh, I'm talking about the move to cloud computing that puts most of the powerful storage and computation in the hands of a small number of companies. I'm talking about the development of the App Store as a layer of control, uh, about the use of big data to turn the system that could have been either a system for control or a system for very generative distributed uh, act activity into a system that provides surveillance capabilities both to governments and to a small, small number of private players, and the ability to design the platform on the fly to manipulate people's behavior. So the level of risk today that the same set of technologies will replicate concentrated infrastructure, concentrated power, and the ability to use the same network capabilities to create surveillance and control instead of self-authorship and collaboration is the great risk that I see today. Yeah, let me comment on this one. Uh, yeah, this internet started sort of about 40 years ago. In the last about 10 years, it's moved, started moving to the smartphone-based system. And uh, this one we had to watch out. Before, that we develop by internet culture, which is a very open. Uh, then uh, this creative common is just one of them. And uh, now this smartphone, <coughs> uh, this ecosystem is uh, driven by the big business. And uh, they don't care so much on uh, this openness, open source, open data, no, they are more about the business driven. So this transformation, how does it affect us as a whole? This, uh, I have a very serious concern. And uh, then uh, since I, there's uh, one more question you said, uh, like uh, Africa, uh, let's start from the Korea. Uh, we, Korea, some happen to be in the internet we are the early starter. Uh, we started the internet in 1982 before anybody else except in the USA. And uh, which has an advantage, but also has a uh, disadvantage. Like uh, spam and uh, all those, uh, uh, those uh, cyber security problems happened to the uh, Korea first and the USA. Then we had to solve it. And uh, we just didn't have uh, enough those, uh, know how to solve this problem. So we solved, uh, since we had to solve it anyway, so we solved in a very ad hoc way. And that became a permanent. So there are, today, Korean, those banking system, including a credit card, is very difficult to use. And it's not particularly safe. And uh, then the user, like, why don't you just change it? No. Changing this kind of things takes up uh, five, 10 years, if it's not a uh, 15, 20 years, and the, in the fortune. The Africa, if you are late karma, sometimes you can take advantage. Just watch out us, how we are doing well and making a mistake, and uh, try not to uh, learn our mistake, uh, learn from our mistake, you know, do not to do it. Just like a bicycle, in a bicycle race, the one in the front suffer because of wind. The one in the second and third, you can take advantage of behind in the uh, leader. So that way, uh, eventually we share the, uh, this problem together. But I just try to take optimize, take advantage of uh, where you are.
Well, um, something that you mentioned, um, like let's imagine that, the, that we are an environmental movement, uh, like the, one of the obvious environmental movement enemies is Shell, for example. That's the symbolism of evil, you know, polluting and uh, doing um, bad to the commons, polluting the waters, pollute, uh, uh, cutting trees for the oil explorations and so on. Which actor, and that question is for the two of you, which actor will be the one harming the commons the most in this space uh, uh, on, at the moment? And are we, uh, do we have the capability to act on it? Or it's, it is a giant too big to fight? Um, I think there's no single stable giant. Uh, I think what there is is a variety of actors and a variety of threats. And the responsible thing for people like us <clears throat> who care about the open internet, who care about the commons, is to not think at too high a level of abstraction, to understand the problems in their real context, to identify who the uh, allies are and who aren't. 15 years ago, Microsoft was the bad guy. It turned out, for example, that on open spectrum, Microsoft and Google were the good guys. Um, interestingly now, as you're looking after the incredibly important revelations of Snowden, which just last week the European Court of Justice directly relied on mm -hmm. to anchor the prohibition on bulk surveillance in a core commitment to human dignity, um, some of the revelations suggested that actually the major companies, Google, Facebook, were part of the bad story, made things available. On the other hand, uh, you suddenly saw a shift to uh, more encryption, and Apple came forward with more encryption. So there are certain things in which Apple is a problem in terms of the App Store and control, and there are other things in which Apple becomes an ally. I think it's a mistake to think in terms of a unitary bad actor, what we have are imperfect systems. The countries are imperfect, the companies are imperfect, we're imperfect. We constantly need to judge locally what's going on, who's an ally, who's an enemy, where the interests are, who we can form alliances with, and then argue about doing what's ethical. And each time do what's ethical, do what's strategic, and move on. Yeah, let me com uh, compliment the ecosystem. This whole thing is an ecosystem. The issue is uh, how can we develop a commons, global commons, in order to address those issues and uh, resolve those issues. And uh, if we can develop a very good global common, then uh, we are in a good shape. If we can't, it's awful. We'll, we'll face the uh, inconvenience truth as a uh, uh, US Vice President, what, what's his name? Al Gore. <laughs> Al Gore said. So the, just try to avoid uh, those inconvenient uh, truth in this cyberspace. You know to that one? Glo global commons, healthy global commons is the way to handle. So the Creative Commons is doing a good job. Well, um, as we have a, one of the most... Just, just to follow up on, on connecting to this question of the Commons, one of the things we learned from Lynn Ostrom and the Ostrom School of Commons, what they described as the institutional analysis and development framework. And it was an attitude to thinking about the world. It was an attitude that saw that different contexts were richly different from each other, and you only got the right answers by looking at all of these factors and seeing what, how the things are connected to each other. So this is back to the point about not thinking in terms of systematically bad actors, always analyzing the details of what makes the ecosystem work, and the thing that could look like the big bad wolf turns out to have a really important impact by controlling the population of these little furry things that are wonderful. You just have to understand what in particular context works and build in response to that. And to this ecosystem, what would be like the greatest threat at the moment? Like if we, if we as, as 
activists uh, need to pick one, one global battle. It is, is it even possible to pick one single global battle, let's say, um, against DRM or against, uh, like, what will be like the battle that you will choose? Cybersecurity. In many ways, this may be the biggest obstacle we have. First, me as a uh, <clears throat> technical background, technically we made a mistake back in 40 years ago. And today we haven't solved this uh, uh, security problem, technically. Then next, this nature of the security is so easy to attack, so difficult to defend. Then uh, uh, this cyberspace also this sort of reflection of the real world. And uh, we are getting uh, so much those uh, uh, disturbance, malicious act in this area. And uh, I don't know if we can solve it. We should be able to solve it. Otherwise, we'll have uh, those holes, those bunch of those uh, uh, world garden, gated community. If you go outside, it's very dangerous. You just stay inside. Then uh, uh, we may lose uh, uh, global commons too. I think security is an issue, but I'm not sure it's an issue in the same way that um, you're describing it. Mm -hmm. I think fear is an issue. I think it's very easy to manipulate concerns of security for purposes of legitimizing control. I think we've seen it certainly in the US over the last 15 or, or, or 14 years, concerns about national security being used well beyond what's necessary. We saw that with warrantless wiretapping, we saw that with excessive surveillance, and I won't talk about the, the graver issues of torture. Um, <clears throat> so security is a real concern when a city is deeply insecure, it collapses socially. We do have to solve security as a problem. But security is also abused easily, mm. and we need to be very realistic about our concerns. You had mentioned in your, um, in your keynote that we live with 1.3 million deaths, you said, from automobile accidents around the world. Uh, we're not canceling the car because of it. Mm. We live in great cities even though they might be less secure than many um, uh, rural communities. Uh, so we live with risk all the time. Being able to absorb and be resilient and respond without shutting down the system is really important. So while I recognize the importance of security threats as very real, uh, I also recognize the fact that there are always extremely powerful forces trying to exaggerate the claims, exaggerate the risk, exaggerate the security that comes from locking things down. And our critical commitment needs to be to openness. So you asked what would be a single target. I think the single target is not something specific like DRM, not a specific battle like the TPP, uh, but it's the continuous fight for openness throughout all layers of the network society, both in terms of the technology and in terms of the organizational and institutional structures. And then you just have to live and diagnose. What is tomorrow's five threats to openness? These are the ones that are our battle. But we need to define our target at that level, I think. Well, see, one of the problems <clears throat> back in uh, say, 20, 30 years ago, internet is much smaller. So it doesn't have a much, so much of those business stake. But now it's a big business. And uh, for the big business, if the openness is good for them to maximize their sale or profit, they will do it. Otherwise, they don't. And uh, they have a power, I mean muscle. So the, how do we counter? Again, back to the, those global commons. That, that's the only way we can really uh, uh, fight against the, uh, those abuse. Yeah. But the question then becomes, how do we, I'm sorry, go ahead. You were no, yes, because 
because we, want, we need to open the floor. We do have to answer these global comments. We have to be able to build it ourselves, not only rely on law. We, the big business does have enormous institutional power in legal systems. The first generation of the net was very much built by and for people who were aiming for openness and created alternative through free and open source software uh, to the infrastructure. That has to be a core target, identifying points of control and creating commons-based alternatives so that people can fall back on them and not be stuck within the controlled systems. And so, power to the people now. <laughs> Who is willing to ask the first question, second question, and third question? And then uh, we let uh, our guests uh, to answer. Anyone? I see one. Any woman willing to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's important to have, uh, so we will have you first, then right. Carolina, and then I, you, yes. Um, uh, the, the, the dichotomy, the, the shift that you described of uh, uh, sort of the, the socially responsible uses of the net versus the corporate-driven, exploitive, extractive uses um, often rely on um, systems like these walled gardens where it makes it more convenient for people. You know, a lot of the reasons people fall into these traps is because it's been made very easy and very often for those of us who want to avoid uh, these kind of uh, traps, it's more difficult. For the classic example, when Windows was the dominant paradigm, if people wanted to reject it and use Linux, they had to do a lot more work to be free. <clears throat> Will it, do you think it will always require us to convince people to change their behavior and do more work to stay free and open and to preserve it? Or uh, do we have to think about how we make it as convenient to be free as it is to be a prisoner? I, I thought that was mostly in, in your direction, but I'm also happy to. Um, I like your answer. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I think it is absolutely tree, true. This Bruce Schneier was saying this, fear and convenience, the two great drivers of people into lockdown systems that don't actually give them freedom. Um, and we talked about fear and security before, mm. and convenience is the other one. Um, I think it's incumbent on, and I actually think this is a, the, also a consequence not only of the technology, but of the transition from the first 100 million or 200 million to the billion, mm -hmm. which is to say more people who actually just want stuff. Um, Netflix. Uh, it's just another TV screen. Um, I do think it's incumbent on those of us who are building alternative platforms to make sure that they are easy. But as you say, with well, it depends, right? So with Linux it didn't, but with uh, 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 Firefox it did. So, and that actually changed dramatically the market share. Mm. So I think that needs to be part of the package whenever an alternative platform is built to understand that market share matters. That creates a real risk. You, we saw with Firefox needing to implement the DRM sandbox that once you actually care about market share, even if you're a free and open source, publicly oriented project, it creates limitations for you. But I don't think we have a choice because otherwise, all we're building is a is a is is a safe preserve for the few who actually uh, are willing to work hard for their freedom. And the whole point is actually to make freedom easy for everyone. And the last question. I'm sorry, I just can take one more uh, to Carolina, please. Okay, so I wanted to ask. Um, about something that for me is a huge dilemma, and it's uh, about the violence online, especially women against women. Um, I was discussing this last year with Frank LaRue, and he came out with an expression which I like a lot to describe this, because he said that's uh, freedom of expression against freedom of expression. Women are being uh, targeted uh, in the digital world with violence, which are preventing them from speaking. Many women are having reactions as to shut down their social networks. 
and not to express themselves. But the reactions many times from the feminist point of view are, you are um, oftentimes also a threat against freedom of expression. They tend to say uh, we should shut down comments and there should be blocking and many other things. For me, this is a real future threat for an open internet for everybody. I wonder what do you think about that? Yeah. You of course. You have yeah. raised the issue of violence. Why no, you go so ahead? you go ahead. I'll <laughs> <come>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> no, you go ahead. No, no, no I, I, I formed my idea. Um, yes, this is an issue that we see online, but it is fundamentally an issue of open society more generally, not of open internet more specifically. That is to say, when you have tightly structured communities, it's very easy to control all sorts of, um, all sorts of, of um, offense and pain. Um, but it's very hard to then actually create a decently participatory and open society. And once you open things up, you get all sorts of violence. And particularly in um, a society in which a global society in which women still very much are not equal in the majority of places, you get violence. Um, I think it's a basic tension that we see throughout open society. I can't tell you that I'm a free speech absolutist in the mm -hmm. sense of uh, no matter what. Um, but I don't think that we can simply say shut things down. I think the core battle is a battle over values. It's a public battle over values rather than of shutting down systems. Um, and it's not specific to the net, it's general to any open society. So the, the raising the issue, debating it, educating, just like, viol just like <laughs> physical violence against women is not, is not something that just disappears. It disappears if you have major campaigns, if you have enforcement where enforcement is appropriate, uh, and if you have primarily a change in, in consciousness, a change in the way people understand things. I think that's the direction we're going to need to go. Okay, uh, <clears throat> the good and the bad news. Bad news, Korea is pretty bad on uh, this cyber violence, including one famous uh, actress committed suicide because of, uh, she was sort of attacked on the, in the cyberspace. So the, we have to uh, we are suffering, and uh, we have to do something. And uh, good news, during the internet, <clears throat> used to be a uh, male dominant. And uh, now, because of SNS, it's changing. Do you know now in a developed country, more uh, women use uh, SNS than the male? That's the statistics we're just getting. So it seems to be this one is uh, SNS, part of the internet, suit to the uh, uh, woman better than the male. And another good news is uh, one of my friends, <coughs> Anietta, she organized a gender on the internet uh, last month at a workshop during the, the, the Africa uh, uh, Internet Governance Forum. And uh, probably we are going to do something similar in Asia and all over. I guess we should address this one more formally, set up in a workshop, all over the world. Then, then identify what's the other issue so that we can take action. But I'm optimistic uh, because of those SNS sort of a, become a dominant application where the female using it more than the male. Well, I don't know, if, um, maybe you have a closing remark, and if not, we can go to the party. Thank you very, very much for uh, your collaboration. Especially, it was very, very interesting to see two of the smartest uh, scholars on internet issues debating the tricky uh, issue of uh, women violence online, and also debating the mobile platforms. I think that, that those are the two takeaways for our community to start thinking about and to start debating. And it's a good a place to start uh, the party. Let's keep talking there. So time for the party, huh? Thank you. 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 Thank you.